Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be back. I attended this course nearly 20 years ago, and for me it's a highlight of the year to come back and meet all the wonderful new attendees. So I've enjoyed thoroughly the past couple of days getting to know some of you. I only have 25 minutes to cover these two exciting vaccines, so uh, apologies in advance. If I don't cover something you wanted to know, you can certainly ask me after the presentation in the discussion session. But let's go ahead and launch and start with rotavirus vaccines. And probably not news to you, before vaccines for rotavirus were used, uh, this was the leading pathogen of severe diarrhea in children worldwide. You can see both in developed and developing countries, nearly one-third of hospitalizations for childhood diarrhea were from rotavirus showing its burden, but also showing that traditional interventions to improve uh, safe water, food, environmental hygiene were not likely to control rotavirus, which is why vaccines were pursued specifically against this pathogen. Probably heard last week in some of the adverse event talks, the first vaccine was licensed back in 1998 in the U.S. Its uh, trade name was Rotashield. It was launched with great fanfare and enthusiasm that we finally had something to control this uh, serious illness. Unfortunately, it only lasted about nine months in the U.S. program. It was recommended for all children, but then about a year later, we identified these reports of intussusception, which I also believe you've heard about last week, and this uh, led to the withdrawal of this vaccine. So it was a very difficult time. It was about the time I was starting in this field. And at that time, there was great uncertainty on whether this adverse event would be seen with other vaccines in development for rotavirus, or was there something unique and you could debate it ad nauseum theoretically. But the real test was to show this in clinical trials, whether the vaccine worked or not. And fortunately, there were two other live oral vaccines that were being developed at the time. The Rotashield was withdrawn. The manufacturers, Merck and Glaxo, conducted large trials. I think you all also read those trials in one of the case studies last week. There were 60,000, 70,000 infants each in the two trials, primarily to rule out a risk of intussusception, which is an uncommon event, so you needed large sample sizes. The good news was that neither vaccine was found to have a risk of intussusception in the trials. Both showed very good efficacy. The trials were done in the U.S., in Finland, in Latin America. At least in those settings, these vaccines performed very well. We also now have two additional oral rotavirus vaccines. They were recommended by WHO for global use two or three years ago, and they are both made by companies in India, and they are like the earlier vaccine. One is a multivalent and one is a monovalent vaccine, and I'll come to that a bit later in the talk. But there are now four rotavirus vaccines that are available for global use, and almost 120 countries worldwide have implemented national rotavirus vaccination, and you can see in green all the countries, the yellow ones are ones that are considering some actually have implemented also. But the, the good news is there's good coverage not only in the high middle-income country settings, but even many low-income countries in Africa, Asia are now using these vaccines. The question when they were implemented in these programs were how well will they do in routine use? They showed good efficacy in the trials, but of course you've also heard real-world implementation of vaccine can be a bit different. And so we were monitoring this is the program that uh, is our primary responsibility in the U.S., which was one of the first countries to implement rotavirus vaccine. And essentially, these are laboratory detections of rotavirus. They mostly come from children hospitalized with diarrhea and testing of those specimens. The blue lines are the total tests ordered. Underneath are the red lines, which are the positive tests. And you can see clearly the six years preceding vaccine, you had those sharp winter peaks in rotavirus, very typical seen in many countries around the world. 
you will also see I don't really need to describe this post vaccine. There's been remarkable impact in anywhere from 80 to 90 percent reduction in hospitalizations for rotavirus that red light at the bottom. So it's, it's, it's uh, really been uh, a huge public health benefit. One additional thing to note, and this is again data from the U.S., what this essentially shows is the reduction in 2008, which is two years after vaccine compared with before vaccine, but it breaks it down by year of, of age of the child. And I really want you to focus on the bottom row, which is the two to three year old children in 2008, they had not received rotavirus vaccine. They were too old to get the vaccine when it was first implemented. It, you can see clearly vaccine coverage was negligible in that age group. But look at the middle column. It's the reduction that you see in rotavirus hospitalizations despite lack of vaccine use was almost as much as the vaccinated age groups. And this was the first indication of what you heard about many times during the course, indirect effects or herd immunity, something that wasn't entirely expected, but certainly a welcome surprise with this vaccine. Another exciting piece of data comes from Mexico. So mortality against uh, diarrhea or the benefits of the vaccine in preventing mortality could not be assessed in the pre-licensure trials because you really need much larger millions of infants. So in the context of the national rollout in, of the vaccine in Mexico, we had an opportunity. They have a uh, excellent registration system of childhood deaths. And you can see again, like what I showed you for the U.S. for, for the laboratory detections, for the four years preceding vaccine introduction, you had these nice wintertime increases in, in deaths from diarrhea. Mind you, these are not laboratory confirmed rotavirus. They are all childhood diarrhea deaths, but they show that pattern and shaded behind those lines is the rotavirus season in Mexico. So at least the, the, the temporal correlation suggests that many of those diarrheal deaths are likely from rotavirus, even though they're not laboratory confirmed. The proof really comes from the impact of vaccine. So the vaccine was introduced in Mexico in 2007. You can see the year after vaccination, that red line is for the less than one-year-olds. That age group had been vaccinated. You saw a marked reduction in all-cause diarrheal deaths in children. The next year, that reduction was sustained in the under ones, but you also saw that blue line now going down, which is the one- to two-year age group that had been vaccinated by then. And we have additional years of data showing that these declines have been sustained. So really exciting data, the first impact of this vaccine in preventing mortality from childhood diarrhea. Another good surprise with the vaccine was this uh, evidence that we've seen from, from many countries of reduction in childhood seizures. And these are not febrile. For the most part, they are afebrile seizures. And it's not seen everywhere, but it has certainly been in, seen in many settings. In one evaluation in the U.S., vaccinated children had an almost 20% reduction in seizures. And you can imagine with seizures, it's a severe outcome. It often requires a lot of laboratory workup and diagnostics. So it's a major benefit of this vaccine, which again wasn't factored in, in the pre-licensure data to support the recommendation. Uh, also the, showing the, the value of post-introduction monitoring. I can't give this talk without talking about intussusception a few times. So as I told you, you can see a risk, but of course, when you roll it out to millions of infants, you can detect lower levels of risk than you were looking for in the trial. And indeed, with both of these vaccines in several high and middle income countries, we have seen a risk of intussusception. It's about one in one to six excess cases for 100,000 vaccinated infants, which is lower than what we saw with Rotashield, where it was about 
one per 10,000. So it's about a log lower than that. But it's been seen and you've seen it with both vaccines in several high and middle income countries. The, the thing we had now, which we didn't have at the time of Rotashield, was data where you could look at the benefits and risk of the vaccine. And these are four countries where they generated their own evidence. And you can see, for example, if we just look at the row on the top for Mexico, uh, with the vaccine, it was estimated nationwide about 11,600 diarrheal hospitalizations and a little over 660 deaths from diarrhea prevented. Versus here is the risk that you would see by nationwide vaccination, 41 into susception cases related to the vaccine, two deaths. And you can see in the rows below, in each of these four countries, the benefits outweigh the risks. And therefore, these countries and WHO has continued to recommend use of this vaccine, these vaccines, despite this known low-level risk, at least for high- and middle-income settings. So that's my first message, part one of the talk, and one message to take from this talk is these vaccines have been a success in high- and middle-income countries, and I hope none of you will debate this, uh, but you're welcome to challenge it in the discussion. The real value of these vaccines is the developing world, and so that's where you really see the mortality burden from rotavirus. These are... Each of those red dots represent 100 deaths from rotavirus, and there are about a, a nearly 200,000 deaths estimated each year. They're focused on settings where access to care is an issue. Once a child with rotavirus gets to a hospital and you can give hydration therapy, mortality is very rare. But in those settings, that those sort of simple basic care also is not accessible. So you really need the, value, the vaccine to work in in these low-income settings. We have seen data both from pre-licensure trials, and this is, again, from post-licensure evaluations. The, the efficacy of the vaccine in and the effectiveness in low-income settings is about 50%, 60%. And that's certainly lower than the 90% we saw in the U.S. and Finland, and about the 60%, 70% you see in middle-income country settings. So there is a gradient of efficacy. Not surprising, these are oral vaccines, and so they face some of the same issues as, say, oral polio does, and I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. One of the concerns initially was that maybe it's the diversity of strains you see in developing countries that is accounting for lower efficacy. The good news is that is not the issue, and I'll show you data. This was from an African trial of the GSK Rotarix vaccine, which is a single strain, G1P8. And so if you look at the vaccine type strains, G1 and P8, in pink here, the efficacy was about roughly 60% for those types. But look at all those other strains which are mismatches from the vaccine type. The efficacy is more or less in the same range with wide confidence intervals. So this is a reassuring finding we've seen in many settings. Rotavirus vaccines, you get good cross-protection against vaccine and non-vaccine type strains. And that's likely because there's a whole live virus and it's not just those antigens that are used to denominate strains, but other antigens that also mediate immunity. But that's a good important message for countries, especially as you look at vaccine choices. It should not be a strange differences really are not the driver for vaccine choice. So if it's not strains, what is it? And as I said, you know, these vaccines are given by mouth. So there's some data uh, from in vitro studies that breastfeeding at the time of vaccination does neutralize rotavirus, and that might impair some of the response. Gastric acid, maternal antibodies, a number of factors that could affect as these vaccines have to may make their way down to the gut where they have to create the immune response. And then just intrinsic host factors, malnutrition, other infections that might impair the response to vaccination. So many possible reasons why they don't do so well in developing settings. And the, the 
One challenge is that despite the vaccines having efficacy of 50-60%, even in countries that have implemented vaccine in low-income settings, you still have rotavirus as the main cause of diarrhea. And I'll show you data from a few countries where they looked at etiology before and after vaccination. So before vaccine, about half of all severe diarrhea in these countries and hospitals was from rotavirus. If I click to the next slide, 50% reduction means that went from 55 to about 22 percent but you still see rotavirus is the main cause of diarrhea even after vaccine use in low-income settings that has really been the driver for trying to think about how we can make these vaccines better there is a plus side to having lower efficacy and replication in the developing world which is that there have been two large evaluations, one in Africa and many countries, one in India, which have not found a risk of intersusception. So probably for the same reasons that the vaccine is less efficacious, it doesn't replicate as well in the gut in, of infants in developing countries, it also carries a lower risk. It's not a something that you would want that the vaccine doesn't work well, but it does have this uh, advantage of potentially not having an intersusception risk in low-income settings. So here's my second point from this talk. The vaccines have had substantial benefit, and I think you heard yesterday that even 50-60% efficacy translates into huge absolute public health benefit. But clearly there's room for improvement. We know we can do better than 56%, 50 or 60%, or at least would like to. So shifting gears then, what can we do to improve these oral vaccines, especially in developing countries. A number of things have been tried, and I'll show you data from a few different studies looking at interventions, and essentially these have been immunogenicity studies. So this is looking at breastfeeding, where in three different studies, and you can see South Africa, India, and Pakistan, they had a group of infants, the red bars for whom breastfeeding was withheld, and then a group for where breastfeeding was encouraged, and they withheld it about an hour around the time of vaccination. And you can see essentially, this is showing you the zero conversion. There really isn't any remarkable difference whether you withheld or not. And in fact, in the study in Pakistan, the response or the immune response is better in the children who were breastfed. So these data were reassuring that even though in the laboratory you thought breast milk might be an issue, in the real world, it is not. And obviously, nobody was going to tinker with breastfeeding recommendations for rotavirus vaccine, but it was good that this is not an issue, and these data reassuringly show that. We've also tried studies where they've supplemented infants prior to getting their vaccine with uh, zinc or, or uh, actually, I'm sorry, that should not, and zinc and probiotics. So they've tried a few different probiotics, and you can see here, this was a factorial trial with four arms. The blue is the no supplement, red is zinc alone, probiotic alone is green, and both are purple. And so there is an improvement, but again, it's not earth shattering. You go from about 27% to roughly 38% zero conversion. So there is some benefit, but it's not um, remarkable or really improving it in a, in a major way. We also have had trials where they've tried to delay the timing of vaccination, and essentially that's to overcome any interference from maternal antibodies. So the GSK vaccine is two doses, and so instead of giving it with DTP 1 and 2 at 6 and 10 weeks, you can give the two doses at 10 and 14. So that's the blue arm, the green is the standard schedule. The red is an arm where they actually gave three doses of that two-dose vaccine at 6, 10, and 14. And again, you can see some modest improvement, but uh, I think it's uh, it's you would I hope you'd agree it's not again going from thirty percent to sixty seventy percent immune response. So there's some benefit, but not nothing remarkable.
there's also an issue where in addition to the lower efficacy in the first year of life, there's apparent waning of protection in the second year of life with these vaccines, especially in developing countries. There have been studies where they've given booster dose of the vaccine with the measles vaccine around nine months of age. And again, you can boost the immune response some, and there's no interference with those other vaccines, but it's not something that has uh, led to any change of recommendation. And finally, another issue that uh, has been looked at is whether the gut microbiome of, of infants affects the vaccine response. And these are data from an evaluation in Ghana where you can see there are some differences in the type of microbiota you see in vaccine responders and non-responders uh, for bacteriorities and, bas and bacilli. But again, there's, it's hard to do a whole lot with the microbiome and mod modulating that is not so easy. And they also looked at a comparison with Dutch infants and you can see the composition is different. So perhaps this does have some effect on the vaccine response, but it's hard to intervene with this particular intervention. So my take-home message number three is there is no good simple approach to improving the performance of these oral vaccines for rotavirus in developing countries. And part of the reason why all those data I showed you on the various interventions has not led to any change in policy is because those were all immunogenicity studies. You know, to do efficacy studies, you need thousands of infants as opposed to hundreds. And there is no good immune correlate of protection. So even if you can show a 10, 15% increase in seroconversion, whether that translates to better efficacy, we don't know. So I think those are things still, still being considered. I'll talk a little bit about two things and then shift to norovirus. There are a couple of different approaches being tried as well, which is Indonesia Biopharma is developing their own rotavirus vaccine, and it's based on a neonatal rotavirus strain identified in Australia. And you will see they did a trial where they looked at both in standard infant schedule, three doses, at uh, 8, 10, and 14 weeks, and they gave a three-dose schedule with a dose at birth, and then 8 and 10 weeks. And the efficacy of that birth schedule actually does appear to be more than the standard infant schedule. And this might be unique to this vaccine because it is based on the neonatal strain. So it grows well in 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 neonates, but it is naturally attenuated. But it's a vaccine they're currently completing their phase three trial. The data will come out in a, a from Indonesia in about a year or so. And finally, uh, there's approaches to try and avoid the oral route, like polio, you know, working on an injectable, inactivated approach to control rotavirus disease. And here we had some, a setback last year, which was the first uh, vaccine that was in a phase three trial, which compared the efficacy of the non-replicating vaccine to the GSK rotavirus vaccine. So it was designed to show superiority. It did not show superiority to the oral vaccine, and this trial was discontinued. So we have uh, a big pipeline, and if you first maybe look at the bottom, there are several other inactivated vaccines, but they're all in early stage development. So they are a few years away. We have these oral vaccines that I talked about that are now in use that we are also trying to improve. So very active field, lots of work to do, and I hope some of you will find ways to make these vaccines work better. So shifting gears, uh, norovirus, uh, which is... Uh, an up-and-coming vaccine is a different, uh, the epidemiology does differ from rotavirus in the sense that it's a major cause of outbreaks. I think you all have heard probably on cruise ships or restaurants for outbreaks of norovirus gastroenteritis. What is not as well recognized, though, is that it's it's a major cause of non-outbreak gastroenteritis as well, and especially as rotavirus vaccines have reduced rotavirus disease, and this is an evaluation from the U.S., it's now the leading cause of severe childhood diarrhea 
in U.S. children. About 21% of gastroenteritis episodes are from norovirus and a significant burden and health care cost. So it's not just outbreaks. It is endemic disease and also a bit different from rotavirus. It's not just young kids, but you get disease in older age groups as well, especially when you look at mortality from norovirus. It's predominantly in the elderly. So it's it's a bit different in terms of which age groups you would potentially want to protect. It's a, it's a complicated virus in terms of its genetic diversity, and there are all those different bubbles show genogroups. So there are 10 different genogroups of norovirus, and within them you have a total of 35 genotypes and more keep being identified. The, the most of the disease across the world is caused by this particular genotype, G24. So that has certainly going to be one of the important targets for a vaccine, uh, but you do see a smattering. The one other challenge beside the diversity is, as was mentioned in the previous talk, norovirus constantly evolves. It's trying to escape immunity. And so every few years you have these new G24 variants. So this is within that G24 type I showed you. Uh, we've had about every two to four years an emergence of a new variant, which is different enough that it escapes population immunity from the previous strain that was around, and it leads to large increases. We used to call them pandemics, but it's a, not not like a COVID pandemic, but certainly in our field, these are pandemics with global increases in norovirus activity. And it, this evolution, again, poses a challenge for vaccine development. There are two vaccines in human clinical trials right now. Uh, I'll describe both of them briefly. There's a virus-like particle vaccine. It was initially made by Takeda. It's now being uh, pursued by a company called Hilovax. It includes these two antigens, G11 and G24, which I showed you, told you was the most uh, common one. It's given intramuscularly as two doses, and it's about to begin a phase 2B efficacy trial in children in the U.S. and in, in Latin America. So this is certainly moving far towards uh, a phase 3 trial and possibly availability in a few years. There's another vaccine, which is an adenoviral vector vaccine. It's made by a company called Vaxart. It's it's an oral vaccine, so it's a single tablet that you get with these two, two strains. And it's also in a phase 2 study in adults where they are looking at dose ranging, but they're also going to give some of those adults a challenge with the uh, norovirus and see whether they are protected or not. So this is, both are moving ahead in clinical testing. The the virus-like particle vaccine that the first one I showed you did go through a trial in U.S. naval recruits, and you can see there is the early evidence for efficacy. These are small numbers, obviously, with wide confidence intervals, but particularly as you go down the gradient of severity for severe disease, the vaccine had almost full protection. It's obviously small numbers, so you can't uh, count on it, but encouraging data at least that there is a prospect to develop a norovirus vaccine. And my last slide and last take-home message for noroviruses, there is clearly a lot of progress, but you do have still a lot of challenges and questions in terms of what age groups you would target. I told, I showed you there's burden in children, but also in the elderly. Do you need a different formulation to produce a good response in different age groups? The genetic diversity of norovirus is going to likely be a major issue, and how do you whether you need to continually update the strains in the vaccine to keep up with evolution? So lots to do. If uh, some of you are interested in the field, this is a very active area. Lots of different players are actively involved in vaccines. So I hope this was uh, somewhat useful. I know I probably touched on many things superficially, so I'll be happy to talk more about anything you'd like in the Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, Kristen, uh, 
my anecdotal personal experience with norovirus is that my children bring it home from daycare and then it spreads to our family very quickly. Um, so is the thinking, and I, and I believe that's where Hilovax is targeting children um, immunization. So it's the thinking that it would confer fairly good herd immunity and this is a good target to protect the elderly through vaccinating children. Yeah, it's a good question. We have done some uh, modeling studies where you do transmission dynamics and look at the potential impact of vaccinating children and what it would do to disease in other age groups. And to the extent you believe in SIRS, infectious disease models, it does show that by vaccinating infants, you would have considerable indirect benefits to elderly, older age groups. I think we have to wait for the data from the trials and the real-world implementation of the vaccine uh, to, sh- to decide whether those models are accurate or not. So the hope is that will happen. Whether it happens, time will tell. Hi, Gonzalo from Argentina. You said that uh, supplementing with both probiotics and zinc will improve the, the, the immune response. I wonder which probiotic they use in the study. They used uh, two different probiotics. They used uh, lactobacillus and they used uh, they used two different lactobacilli, Sazi and Ramnag. And they gave both of them, uh, it was actually a fairly intense period, about six weeks of supplementation prior to the first dose and, and prior to the second dose. So it was not like just a single dose before they got vaccine. They supplemented them after enrolling them at birth for a while. And that's what led to those modest improvements. Up here and then in the back. Hello, Pamela from Cameroon. Um, my question focuses on uh, the efficacy because you, from your presentation, it shows that OPV has an effect on rotavirus um, efficacy. Now, in our vaccination calendar, we actually administer both. I, wanted to, I was wondering if there were any studies that were carried out with um, delay, maybe one or, or spacing these two uh, vaccines and what the results were. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. So I did not cover that at length in the lecture. Uh, So yeah, there's clearly an effect of OPV on rotavirus when they're given simultaneously. I would also point out importantly, and just to be clear, there's no effect of rotavirus on OPV. I think if rotavirus vaccine was going to impair the performance of OPV, it probably would not have been recommended, or at least would have been recommended separately. Uh, there is, There are data where they did both concurrent administration and spacing them by about a week or so, giving them separately, and you clearly see benefits, uh, especially on the rotavirus immune response. I would say the efficacy data, and not, again, many studies have looked at Uh, concurrent versus separate administration and looking at efficacy as an outcome. But there's one study in Latin America which did look at that, and they did not see an efficacy difference. So uh, that's also important to remember. The immunogenicity differences you see may not directly translate to difference in clinical protection. And there is an, in fact, there is a negative effect, and nobody is denying that, but whether it has any clinical relevance, we don't know. And practically, spacing them out in real-world immunization programs is not uh, so easy. So I think at least for most settings, they give both of those concurrently. So, Dennis from Denmark, uh, you showed some quite clear demographic differences in, 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 in the efficacy of the rotavirus vaccine. Was the, were they, this factor also taken into the consideration in a path study on, on the parental versus oral? No, it's, um, all the data for the gradient in efficacy I showed you is with the oral vaccine. The hope with the inactivated vaccines is there may still be a gradient, but it would not be that great. Uh, I think we do see, even with, say, pneumococcal vaccine and so on, there is a slight reduction in the immunogenicity, probably from just intrinsic host factors, how good the kids mount immune responses, whether they're malnourished or not. 
but all the other factors that are particularly ch unique challenges for an oral vaccine similar to polio are mostly for the oral vaccines. And that's really the reason and the driver for the agenda to develop a non-oral rotavirus vaccine, uh, which is still now, unfortunately, gone back to early stage candidates since that path vaccine so did not may I, work. May, may I follow up? Where were, they con where were these studies conducted? The one for PATH, the clinical trial was in three African countries, in Ghana, Zambia, and Malawi. So so in your opinion, how would, would if, because there you had about 60% efficacy in, in, in Africa, in the African countries, uh, whereas in, in Asia and India and Pakistan, you only had 30. How do you think that the, the parental one would uh, perform there? So maybe I'll clarify if I confused you. So the efficacy of the vaccines, the oral ones, in low-income settings in both Africa and Asia is about 50-60%. I think you're remembering the immunogenicity response of about 30%. As I said, it doesn't correlate with the efficacy. So the oral vaccines are similar within low, middle, high-income settings across the world. With the parenteral vaccine or the the vaccine that was in clinical testing. As I mentioned, it was designed to show superiority to the oral vaccine. And so it was the sample size was roughly about an 80% efficacy compared to the 50-60% with the oral vaccine. And it did not show that. So the interim analysis, we haven't seen the full data, but the data safety board uh, stopped the trial halfway for because it wasn't showing superiority. Uh, Oesh, hi. I, I stood up because of the first question that came there, which, for my sins, I'm also responsible for rotavirus surveillance in the UK. And I think what really got me in the beginning was the the, the amount of herd immunity the program uh, uh, instigates. Clearly, the work that you did at the beginning, saying, look, we're vaccinating one-year-olds, look at the effect on two- and three-year-olds. But we did it at a national level. And the thing is, nobody tests adults or elderly people for, for rotavirus. So the test positivity is a real poor indicator in the adults because you're just not capturing it. When you look at the few that were tested, um, but extend it to hospitalizations for acute gastroenteritis, like a probe study, we saw 80% of the reduction in hospitalizations was in the adults and the elderly. And so we had 50,000 hospitalizations prevented uh, during uh, the first five years every year, and 80% of them was in the adults and the elderly, which is phenomenal. Nobody could have predicted such a big herd impact uh, in a country like that. And we did it for five years, and consistently for five years, there is a constant reduction in adults and the older adults getting it. Yeah. My question to you, which I'm really struggling is, we are vaccinating babies at two, three, four months of age who are in nappies, in their cribs, who are not going to nursery, who are not going to daycare, who are actually not even moving around. And yet that vaccine is able to induce herd immunity across the population in adults and older adults to that extent. I can't explain it. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you for that comment on the burden in adults. If you go to my slides from ADVAC 14 or 15, I did have that slide in my talk. So each year I have to add something, I have to take something out. So I couldn't show the UK data, but you're absolutely right in the UK. And we have data from the US that there's an unmeasured burden of rotavirus in older age groups, which you have uncovered almost by using the vaccine as a probe. In terms of how it prevents older disease, I don't know if you were here for David Goldblatt's lecture yesterday, but he had that uh, that photo where the, the grandparents were visiting the babies and uh, uh, he, he at, le at least he retracted, but he sort of was showing how the grandparents get exposed from or actually get infected through exposure to young babies. And so with rotavirus, you're absolutely right. You're going for very young infants. They may have older siblings, and that's likely a source of some of the infection in the community. 
uh, perhaps for the elderly age groups, that is an example, but it's also likely just a general reduction in force of infection at the community level by taking out children who are likely a major source of transmission. You sort of are making the environment almost rotavirus free in the community. Uh, excuse me. I remember you 10 years ago, you were running the world uh, <laughs> looking for the data to to evaluate the vaccine effic uh, eff efficiency. So uh, what was uh, your um, major frustration? Because I know that sometimes you don't have the access to the data, sometimes you have a bad quality of the data. And so how, how what do you recommend to the local epidemiologists or national immunization program, or at least you were more in contact with laboratory team? So yeah. it was, yeah. Thank, well, you. thank you for that question. I still am running around looking for data with some others, of course, not alone. Uh, I think that's one of the beauties of coming to a course like this. I can tell you concrete instances of meeting people who go back to the countries and do some of these studies, and we've worked with them. Even the group in Indonesia where I showed you the trial, it's being run by the PI as a former ADVAC attendee, and so we are now working with him to plan the post-introduction evaluation in Indonesia. So a lot of it is building networks and getting good people. We've been fortunate to be relatively well-resourced, not so much from my home agency. They do support our time to do it, which is important, but the funding for much of the work has come from Gavi and Gates Foundation, so a shout-out to them for supporting a lot of this work. And, and it's just been a, a wonderful experience working with a lot of good researchers and people around the world. So as I said, there's still a lot of work to do, so... I would love to, I unfortunately have to catch a flight, so I won't be able to talk to you more, but I did put up my email. It's my first initial, Parashar at cdc.gov. So if you have interest, please send me a note and would love to find ways to work together. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned breastfeeding and OPV as reasons that might have reduce um, efficacy in low middle income countries compared to high middle income uh, high income countries. Sorry. So my question is did you also look at um, hygiene? It's a good question. So as I showed you very early on, you see rotavirus in the US, you see it in uh, any country in Africa, about the same prevalence in hospitalized children. There is a difference in the absolute burden, clearly, but you, it's equally prevalent. So hygiene, and again, I think we're still not exactly sure how rotavirus transmits. It's not typically fecal-oral. There's more data now that probably transmits respiratory for the most part, or at least uh, or through oral secretions. We've done some studies with air sampling where you can find it in very high rates in children who are hospitalized in air samples in those same rooms. So it's given how infectious it is, it's not surprising that it is partly through the respiratory route. We have, we are doing a trial, so there will be data which we don't have. We collaborated with a group at London School where they did a cluster randomized trial in, in Mozambique where they had some villages where they did a wash sanitation hygiene intervention in a group that did not have the intervention. And we are doing the analysis now on the laboratory specimens to compare the vaccine immune response. So whether improvements in sanitation hygiene in a community actually improve the vaccine takes. It's again, most of these studies are immunogenicity, and so whether that will translate into protection is a different thing, but at least we'll know the answer for the immune response. Um, hi, Tabelo from Lesotho. With regards to the um, reduction in the in the risk of seizures, is it in all seizure types? Has it been demonstrated in all settings? And do we know what the mechanism is? Yeah, it's a great question. And maybe I might ask Shames to chime in on this one too because he's uh, done some work on this in the UK. The seizure reduction, so if, maybe taking a step back, there was data before the vaccines were used of reports of children with rotavirus who had neurologic manifestations, meningitis, seizures. And in some instances, in addition to finding rotavirus in stool, we have CSF 
detection at least by RT-PCR of rotavirus. So there is a biological plausibility. I also did not show this explicitly, but rotavirus is not a gut infection. In severe hospitalized children, about uh, as many as two-thirds have viremia. So it's really a systemic infection, all of which points to real biologic plausibility of spreading to other tissues causing those manifestations. As I said, the reduction is not in febrile seizures per se, so it's not related to the fever rotavirus causes. It's afebrile seizures for the most part. But I don't know, is if you want to add to that, uh, since you've done some work on this also. So, so we did look at this, and there are some really nice studies, and there's one from Spain that I remember distinctly that shows clearly that the risk of afebrile seizures in infants under one year of age went down temporarily with rotavirus vaccination implementation. And uh, we know from clinical practice, we used to get infants who used to come in with afebrile seizures, and you do all the tests and lumbar punctures, and you put them through MRI scans, and the only thing that they have is rotavirus in the stools. And, you know, the reduction in rotavirus hospitalizations was associated with a reduction in afebrile seizures. The problem in the UK is we haven't really managed to show it is because we have an administrative database. And an afebrile seizure is such a non-specific uh, clinical entity that there's so much noise on it. If you see a 5 or 10% reduction, it'll get lost in the noise. So for something like that, you do have to go to well-conducted studies where they have more detailed data. And the ones that I have seen pretty much confirm a reduction in, in, in afebrile seizures because of the vaccine. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And really the reason I showed that slide is to make the point that none of these other benefits were considered in the recommendations for use of the vaccine or cost effectiveness. They're all based on prevention of diarrhea. So these post-introduction evaluations, if the data hold, really show you the vaccine goes beyond what its expected benefits were. So we have a question from somebody upstairs. Yeah, so Umesh, I'm going to be asking the question for her. So this is Helen, and she's asking if there's any evidence of genotype replacement and your thoughts about the comparison between the pentavalent and the monovalent vaccine in that regard. Yeah, it's a, it's another great question. So genotype replacement is one of those where if you put a 100 rotavirologists in the room, you'll come up with different answers. So in some settings, and I'll say maybe use Australia where Mayo comes from, they have a unique setting where they initially had some states, about half the states which were using the pentavalent vaccine and half that were using the monovalent. I think it's now more uniform. Uh, but in the initial years of rollout, they actually saw in the states with monovalent vaccine, the G1P8, you saw a lot more G2P4, which is the one strain that's most different from the G1P8, both for the surface antigens and just the whole viral genetic backbone. That did not hold out, though. Over time, as you got into four, five, six years, it was, again, similar across the two. So whether that was just fluctuations that we know happen over time, it was a peculiar finding in the U.S. We have not seen it. In Brazil, they saw a lot of G2P4 initially, which also went away. So I think if I were to put a, put a bet on it, I would probably say that there is not any consistent evidence of ecologic replacement, um, regardless of whether you're using the monovalent or pentavalent vaccine. And at least a lot of the post-introduction vaccine case control type evaluations looking at strain specific effectiveness with either the monovalent or pentavalent vaccine you get good cross protection again i had those data at one point but have had to take it out do we have one last really quick question because we're running out of time sorry thank you it's very quick uh, angela from the uk um the takeda vlp vaccine looks to perhaps be promising for noro um, the, the, I'm sorry if I missed it, the vaccine that failed to show superiority in the phase three, the PATH trial, was that a, a VLP or was that a different no, I did not show the, yeah, it's a great, good question. I could not show the, so it was a, a subunit vaccine based with a VP8 backbone and then three different 
uh, it was not VLP. It was a different technology with a subunit vaccine. And I can share it with you the more specific details. Okay, that, that's great. So just yeah. Because what you were saying about rotavirus being a systemic infection, really, mm-hmm. you, it would it would give hope for, for that sort of um, yeah. method of administration. To yeah, and actually, vaccine. at least in some of the other work we have done with our inactivated strain at CDC, you do get mucosal immunity as well. And, and again, this is still in pigs and in um, in in mouse models it's not human data but you can introduce induce gut immunity even with the parenteral approach and are there any mrna vaccines in development for rotor or neuro do you know uh, I don't know if there are people from, I don't want to reveal any secrets. <laughs> I'll just say yes broadly and not go into any detail. 